So good evening, everyone, and welcome at the Royal Netherlands Institute in Rome. Um, a cordial welcome also to those who are connected with us remotely. I'm Maria Bonaria Urban. I'm the Director of Study in History at this institute. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, CNIL Research Dialogue. Um, many of you are here for the first time. The students probably is the first CNIL Research Dialogue. So what is this CNIL Research Dialogue? It's a lecture series which focuses on the topic of colonialism mainly and on the um, material legacy of colonialism from an interdisciplinary and transtemporal perspective. And this is the first of this academic year. I'm very honored and pleased uh, to introduce our guest of today, Dr. Mariana Franzoso from Leiden University. And act actually, Mariana today is also the keynote speaker of a workshop which has been hosted here. The workshop was on staging Italianità between race, science and the arts museums, exhibitions, festival, and the making of identities in Italy, 1911-1967. So first of all, I would like to thank Mariana for kindly ac accepting our double invitation for the workshop and for the CNIR Research Dialogue. And we are really eager to learn more about your fascinating research on this, uh, on, 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 on your fascinating research. Um, only a few words about the schedule of the uh, lecture. We will start, of course, uh, with Mariana lectures, and then we'll have a plenty of time for the discussion. Uh, also, the people of, um, that are joining us, us on remotely can, of course, post questions in the chat. And uh, um, I think we have a mo almost 40 minutes also for the discussion. So we'll have a really plenty of time for it. And now I'd like really um, brief, uh, briefly intro introduce uh, Dr. Mariana Franzoso. She's an associate professor of museum studies at the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University. Her research stands at the intersection of anthropology and history and focuses on the collection and circulation of indigenous objects and knowledge from Brazil to Europe, with special emphasis on the early modern period. She has published articles in several journals and her latest book, Toward an Intercultural Natural History of Brazil, published by Rutledge in 2023, explores the early modern history and the possi possible contemporary uses of the 17th century treatise Historia Naturalis Brasilia. And I'm, I know that Maria will also engage with some of the issues that we have discussed during the workshop. So I'm very happy to leave the floor to Mariana. Thank you very much. Okay, so well, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for this very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Maria and Beatrice, for the invitation um, and, and the trust <laughs> uh, when you invited me to um, give this lecture. Um, I was part, or at least I, I was here for the seminar today. Um, so I wanted to start by making just a very some very few remarks about um, yeah the discussions we had and the topics that uh, that came up. I'm sorry, I must say next to my latest publication, my most important work is that little boy uh, over here <laughs> and uh, he demands a bit of attention. So apologies, <laughs> mama já vai querido. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, I'll start now um, by saying a few words about the, the workshop that we um, just had and how I think um, well, it certainly, let's start like this, uh, it certainly helped me think about a series of topics that either I'll present here or I won't because they're too, well, raw <laughs> to be presented, but the workshop already made me think of, of a number of things that I need to look into for my own research, but I'll hope, I hope that what I will say here can also contribute to the discussions and the further um, work of all of the speakers of today. And I guess, um, so the workshop, the workshop takes indeed, um, as Beatrice explained this morning when introducing the workshop, it, it took quite a significant time frame, 1911, 1967. 
Um, and at first I thought, well, I, I'm not sure I can really say something about this period because, well, mostly I focus on early modern, but also late later 20th century, so two extremes. And I was wondering, but it, it, when reading the abstracts and especially today listening to the presentations, um, it became very clear that this extended period, in fact, is a snapshot of something very important that is happening in the history of anthropology worldwide, but specifically in this case for Italy, but solidified um, in Europe as such with the, import, the emergence of photography as one of the main um, means through which anthropology was uh, created and was practiced in this period. And not all of you talked about photography, um, of, about the role of photography, but almost all of you used photography and uh, photography of the time in your talk. So I think there you have really a point um, about the importance of that, um, of that media in consolidating ways of making, uh, ways of doing anthropology. And I'll say anthropology many times, I'm an anthropologist, so everything that I say comes from this perspective of being a social anthropologist, um, trained in Brazil, but working now um, in the Netherlands and, and elsewhere. The other thing that I think is very important, uh, or at least to my mind, uh, became clear um, today during the workshop is that together, I think all of the papers sort of point to the format of exhibition. So the exhibitionary format as a media and a language that creates, that builds and unbuilds, destroys identities, uh, whatever they are, they are, right? It creates and it conceals. I think not all of the papers talked directly about exhibitions, but they, they all did in a certain way. Um, I think it was Luca who, who apologized by saying, I don't talk about exhibitions, I talk about film festivals, but the structure of, let's say, the exhibitionary machine is there. And that machine, all of you showed uh, in your papers, um, is composed of many elements and each one of you seems to have focused or chosen to focus on certain parts of making that machine work. So from um, the very simple selection of objects for exhibition, but also the selection and creation of objects that support the exhibition. And I'm thinking, I can't remember now, um, who it was, I think it was, might have been Agnese, the first speaker who showed us pictures that were used to create the exhibition, but not to be shown. Fantastic pictures, by the way, uh, going back to photography. So uh, the selection of objects to show and to support the narrative, to create the narrative, um, the architecture, there was a lot about architecture and design and the spatial elements of the exhibition. We also heard a lot about that. Um, you've discussed the political, the diplomatic um, um, concerns or the diplomatic activities that go on behind the scenes when making an exhibition or when, when creating a museum. All of the necessary negotiations, and, and, and some of these words are going to come back in my talk now, the negotiations that are necessary for the planning and the execution of the exhibition, exhibition structures, exhibition units, units that repeat themselves in different exhibitions, even if the topics are not the same, there seems to be a language of exhibitions that you all um, focused on. Um, and of course, um, um, and perhaps that's what I'm going to try to do as well today, uh, uh, thinking of these exhibitions or the exhibitionary machine in the framework of larger national and international exhibitionary circuits. Um, so I think, well, I might be wrong, but this is how I uh, interpret what uh, what we discussed or what you presented today. I think there's a lot to, to be derived from that, a lot of uh, interesting thoughts about how these mechanisms worked in the past um, and sort of taking up the challenge of the large time scale, more or less large time scale. What I want to do today is to continue that and start way past the deadline of 1967, way, start more or less in the 1980s with um, some thoughts from inside the museum. I think uh, the most of the talks today, not all, but most of the talks today talked a lot about exhibition, representation, what the visitors saw. There was also, can't remember, I think Matilda showed us uh, beautiful pictures of the visitors. Those things are precious, at least in my view, maybe not, but I, I thought they were precious images of people interacting, even physically being there in the exhibition. So we talked 
about representation, about what happens when you visit the exhibition or what the intentions were, uh, what the power structures were in the creation of those shows, um, um, festivals, exhibitions, etc. I want to look now at uh, museum anthropology from the inside, what happens in the museum uh, or what happens around the museum, about the museum. And basically what I'm referring to in, in terms of concept, concepts um, and theory is uh, the um, emergence in the 1990s of uh, some very important, still very influential literature um, on museum anthropology that sort of consolidated museum anthropology as a field. Um, I'm talking about um, uh, books and, and articles and works by um, anthropologists and museum practitioners, anthropologists who became museum directors. That's the case of Michael Ames, the book on the your right, my left, I think. Um, and what this is a very important moment, I think, in um, the history of this um, of thinking about museums or the ex exhibitionary machine that I that, that's expression that I'm using um, today because they are all sort of um, they emerge from the legacy of the post-colonial critique of the 60s and in that sense I was I was very um, drawn to the talk by uh, by Elena Canadelli today when she talked she started saying some things about the uh, museums of natural history in Berlin and in London and how they are revisiting their histories their collections uh, their ma the material legacy of, of colonialism or not but their material histories um, and she mentioned a criticism by Ferguson in 1965, and that's really, I guess, from the 60s to the mid 80s when uh, disciplines such as anthropology, history, archaeology in a different way are doing sort of a self-reflection on how it is that they write about the other or about the self, but how it is that they're writing, how do they do research, how do they portray um, the peoples that they study. And this led in very almost practical terms to, to the rise of this literature in the 90s that turns the question of representation to the museum itself, inside the museum. And perhaps, um, well, those these two were very important uh, works um, in, that, um, in this um, line of thought in which they are really discussing what it is that a museum does and what it should do when exhibiting cultures. Exhibiting cultures, in fact, is a book that is also the result of a workshop, a series of workshops held at the Smithsonian in, I think, 1989 or something, late 80s. The book itself is from 1991. Cannibal Tours is 1992. But it's really the, the moment when museums from the inside um, very clearly start oh. producing theory about themselves, or at least the theory that we're still using now. Now, next to that um, comes the concept a bit later, 1990, published in 1997, but reflecting on earlier events, comes the concept of contact zone. And I'm sure most of you will have at least heard or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a concept in museum anthropology that became really the concept, one of the most repeated things to say about museum, the yeah. museum is a contact zone. But it is very, it is something very powerful if we really take it to it, if we really take its original definition seriously. And the original definition comes from the work of Mary Louise Pratt, uh, who is a literary scholar. Um, James Clifford uh, borrowed the term. He himself discusses Mary Louise Pratt's definition, which is the contact zone is a space of colonial encounters, the space in which peoples geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict. And those three, two last parts of the sentence, three actually, conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict are to me, perhaps the most powerful and most important elements of the contact zone, which then defined by Clifford becomes, uh, or defined by Clifford when museums are seen as contact zones, their organizing structure as a collection becomes an ongoing historical, political, and moral relationship. 
a power charged set of exchanges of push and pull. And again, many um, people writing and studying and researching the history of museums or museum anthropology, museum dynamics in the present still use this idea of contact zone as if it, it is about a cultural encounter. It is actually, in fact, about the creation of a space of transformation. And, and in a way, in your talks, you were also talking about spaces of transformation. Um, but what I want to do today is to look at those spaces of transformation from within, with their own eyes. So um, this critique of um, museums from the 80s and 90s, it went hand in hand with transformations in museum structures, uh, museum financing, and in the museum world. Um, you, you all know, of course, that in the last, even more recently, in the last 20 years, Many museums, especially those of uh, anthropology, his, uh, cultural history, et cetera, um, ethnography or prehistory and ethnography, as was the case um, here, uh, they have transformed um, and they have rebuilt and many of them have rebranded themselves. They have changed names. They have merged with other museums. And all of this is, of course, motivated by very practical um, reasons, um, normally budget cuts. It's never, a, you know, the increasing of the budget that allows the museum to transform, unfortunately, recently, although there are exceptions. Um, but in this transformation, which takes very long, uh, so decades sometimes, uh, museums have taken the criticism very seriously, um, at least the ones I will exemplify today. And they have transformed that criticism, that self-reflection, that what is the material legacy of colonialism here? Right? What is our origin and what is our role today? Um, and often also sort of incited or questioned by funding institutions who themselves ask, okay, we are going to fund you, we have this budget available, but why do you even exist? Who goes to a museum of anthropology? Who visits, who cares about prehistory, et cetera? So in an attempt to answer that question, but also I think genuinely uh, um, reflecting on themselves, they have rebranded re and they have many of them decided to incorporate that self-criticism in exhibitionary form. So what I was saying just a, a bit earlier about the exhibitionary form or machine, the structures, the units, the um, um, design, the relationship to space, the choice of objects, the choice of voices that are, um, um, well, that are staged and how they are staged in the museum, they are also put to work in favor of that self-criticism. And I'd like to show you three or four examples. This first one, I don't know if you've been there, if you haven't, very interesting place, uh, if you have the chance, of course, the Museum of Ethnography in uh, Geneva in Switzerland, um, a very rich city with a very interesting sort of colonial past, not, not as uh, direct as other cities like Paris or London, but still um, uh, the hair of a lot of, um, of the legacy material and financial legacy of uh, colonialism and of empire. When they rebuilt, when they reopened, and I think it was in 2014 that they reopened, they uh, decided to start their permanent exhibition with this sort of well, you can't really see it well, the picture I took, so apologies, but um, this sort of boat-like display structure in which they placed uh, the oldest of their objects, and especially the ones that came um, from cabinets of curiosities, Wunderkammer, 18th century travels, uh, um, early 19th century colonial or um, um, natural history expeditions, and, and also things that they inherited from wealthy Swiss or, or well, people from, from Geneva who had also in their families collected materials. And they do so in a very, well, very, it's always a choice, but in a rather um, direct way. By showing the objects, they, they show human remains or actually objects made of human remains, not human remains as such, but flutes and, and other objects made with bone, for instance. Um, and they say um, the museum was founded in the early 20th century, but its collections have a much longer history, some beginning as many as two centuries earlier. Actually, there's even older than that. 
And the objects in this museum tell us not only about peoples, but also about our own history and our taste for the objects of the other. And I put this quote here because I think this last part, our, our own taste of the for the objects of the other is really very, very important in that it sort of sums up the point of um, the point of arrival, but also the point of departure of a lot of um, criticism into museums and museum history. So this idea that museums, especially those showing foreign cultures, be they foreign from different countries or internal others, uh, we have seen many examples of internal others here for Italy. Um, they are very much talking about the Western or the museum's own taste for objects of the other. So this process of all ordering and, and authority is clear in this particular museum, but there are many others. There's another example, I don't know if you've visited, had the chance to visit this other museum, the Musée de Confluence in Lyon, uh, which is a new museum with very old collections. They have, um, they um, sort of were created, this museum was created through the merger of all of the municipal museums and collections of the city, or most of the museum collections um, of the city belonging to the city of Lyon. So you will have archeology, span ethnography. Uh, I think there's some prehistory. There's definitely a lot of natural history, but there's urban history, there's uh, um, decorative arts, all of that under one roof and quite a roof. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure what I think of it, but it's, it, it's there, right? The building. And you see it very clearly when you're walking um, along uh, the, the, the river. Of course, the name of the museum itself, Musée de Confluence, is, is a very good name to talk about something that attempts to join things together, collections and histories and peoples, and to be the center of the city of Lyon when it comes to cultural history. So when they opened, they uh, also organized, this time a temporary exhibition called Collection Notebooks. Um, I'm translating, uh, my French is, I'm, I won't, you don't need to hear my French. So anyway, Collection Notebooks was the name of this temporary um, exhibition whose aim was to allow the visitor to step into museum storerooms by following the 19th century notebooks where natural history specimens and ethnographic artifacts are listed. So very much uh, also similar to some of the discussions and presentations today, this is really a study like yours in the form of an exhibition. They're looking at the archives, they're guiding um, the viewer, guiding the public through their own history, through their own archives and using the archival material for that. This is how the exhibition itself looked like, looked like. So you can see indeed natural history and ethnography and many different things together. And as you walk through the exhibition, you would really see the history of 19th century expeditions um, um, being told with quite some criticism. They went as far as typologizing the collectors themselves. Normally the collector will be the one making types of the things they find. So these are these kinds of stones, these kinds of ceramics, this culture, that culture. No, the museum decided we're going to explain to our public what kinds of collectors are there. So it was a very clear attempt at saying, this is our colonial history. This is how our collections were formed and with sort of a mini mea culpa in the form of a temporary exhibition. Another example, which is the last ethnographic example that I will give is of the Museum Mark, Museum on Rottenbau in Hamburg, the former, again, renew, rebrand, change the name, change the exhibition's mission statement, the former uh, Museum of Ethnography or Ethnology of the city of Hamburg. And this one I find a very interesting example because while Hamburg is a, an incredibly important city economically, historically, for many, many reasons, it is not the capital of the, well, of the country, of the state of Germany. Um, and it has a very important uh, maritime history, right? Uh, a lot of, of its uh, wealth comes from the harbors and from all of the commerce that the city um, has been doing since the 19th century and did in the 19th century. And what they did was to reveal that, to make that very clear and to say our collection. So they had also, a, a, this one, I think it's a se semi-permanent or 
up to now permanent exhibition when they reopened 2017, I think it's when they reopened. They put on a show called, called First Things, Looking Back to Look Forward, in which, again, using archival material, using specific examples of objects, they're telling the story of their collections. They are um, giving us the names of the people's people, different people, normally men, who donated, um, but not only, who donated materials for their collection, really trying to put it out in the open. This one was very nice because you could, uh, they scanned all the old 19th century uh, catalog, um, fiches de catalog, I, I don't know how to say this, like catalog files. Um, and you could browse through them. You could really um, see their primary sources in making this exhibition. So again, a museum that um, reopens and tells the visitor, hey, this is where we came from. Um, and there are many other examples. The Ethnography Museum in Cologne, uh, already in 2010, I think, or 11, they reopened and they had a, a very large gallery about how their collections were formed. Um, so that's one of the earliest. Uh, but there are more. I mean, um, nowadays, uh, in the case of the Netherlands, um, the National Museum of World Cultures, also a merger, uh, has this um, exhibition called Our Colonial Inheritance at the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, which also reflects on colonialism and the material legacy thereof. And I'm probably forgetting, but, and you know it as well, I think the Museo delle Civiltà, I still call it Pigorini, apologies, because my head is back in the 19th century, but I think they also had, I don't know if it's still there, um, at the entrance, they had sort of a, a few um, um, yeah, showcases talking about, uh, or showing their archives, their inventory books, etc. So there's a lot. There's a lot of this um, sort of self-critique um, or attempt to become transparent or attempt to be transparent becomes not good, really made physical, made into an exhibition. And then it is up for the public to interpret, to think, to decide what to do with that. Um, and of course, these I'm talking a lot about museums of ethnology and ethnography, but um, that's not the only case. Um, as I pointed uh, to in my um, in my abstract, and I think some of you also mentioned um, something related to this, art museums are also questioning themselves, right? I mean, the, the whole idea of loot and restitution is the topic in the museum world, or it seems to be nowadays, every now and then there's a scandal or a good news or something, but always about restitution. And um, contemporary artists or artists in general seem to have a sort of liberty to talk about topics that we as academics do not allow ourselves. So while I was preparing for this talk, I, I really, I kept thinking of this exhibition I saw at the Mauritz House in The Hague, uh, which is a fine arts uh, portrait gallery um, sort of museum. But a few years ago in 2016, they uh, had this show by um, artist Vic Muniz. Verso was the name of the show. And when you, when you came in, what you saw was this sort of storage like gallery. And at first you thought, oh, well, why are the, you know, what's wrong? What am I doing here? But the point, the whole point of the exhibition was that Vic Muniz studied the backsides of the paintings of some of the most important, most famous paintings of the Mauritz House and of other fine art, European fine art museums, and he reproduced the back of the painting. So of course the joke as a visitor, what I like to do is, oh, if I look at the back, do I know which one it is? Do I know, am I so knowledgeable? But that's not the point here. The point is that he, as a contemporary artist, was able to sort of anticipate in, in a few years, of course, provenance has been a problem for many, many decades, but he sort of anticipated, it seems to me, through this exhibition, through showing the labels and, and the history um, that is materially carried by the paintings, he anticipated this anxiety that museums are living today of um, showing um, the provenance of their material. And then again, as I said, provenance is really the word in the museum world now. So um, my point in this section is to tell you or to show you that the criticism of museums is also present inside. There's a very strong attempt um, to rethink what to do. And I think in many cases, at least the museum curators that I've been 
um, talking to. I know there's at least one uh, listening to us today from home. So, hey, hi there. Um, I think at least most museum curators that uh, I've talked to are very open to discussing how and when um, and with whom those sort of more democratic forms of exhibiting and more egalitarian or more equal or more, more morally sound forms of collecting and, and deaccessioning, so giving back, uh, restituting are. Now that's all from the point of view of the museum. What I want to do in my um, last few slides, um, and I named it what happens in the museum does not stay in the museum, is to talk about what happens when the exhibitionary machine and the museum collections and the museum um, institute or museum system, let's say, is put to work by actors that are foreign to the museum, but that have a vested interest in what they do and in their collections. In other words, what happens when the museum does become a contact zone, like um, James Clifford suggested, what happens when stakeholders, indigenous peoples, communities, artists, use the museum as a place that belongs to them. And what does it do to the exhibitionary machine? What does it do to us as anthropologists? Where does it put us? And what does it do to the colonial legacy or to the material legacy of colonialism, or colonial legacy of museums, sort of the same. And the reason that that can happen is, um, as Nicholas Thomas puts it, and by the way, again, um, another um, museum thinker that I highly recommend, Nicholas Thomas, is, I think, uh, still the, the director of the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, has written, published many, many works reflecting on how museums work. And in his latest, uh, latest book chapter, in this case, he says, the relative physical stability that makes it possible for something to be a museum artifact thus makes it inevitable that its identity is not stable, that it outlives the character and significance that it starts with or possesses at any given moment, which is probably well, a, a very um, nice, um, eloquent way to say that the meanings of objects and the meanings of collections vary, can vary, should vary, and that the museum as a repository, the museum as a institution that makes sure that the object continues to exist as it is physically, also allows by doing so the object to transform itself in meaning and to transform others. So I'll give you two concrete examples because otherwise it becomes too, too metaphysic. Um, talking about art and talking about um, the contact zone in indigenous peoples. I don't know if anyone has ever seen this um, before or has been to the National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. This is a one of the 11, as far as we know, 11 surviving feather capes uh, made by the Tupinamba people. The Tupinamba were indigenous Look at what I'm saying. I said were. Okay, the Tupinamba were and are still indigenous peoples living um, in the coastal area of Brazil. They were one of the first that were, um, let's say, encountered or that suffered the consequences of the European invasion. Um, and for a long time, um, historiography and even anthropology had it that they had disappeared. They had been decimated, they had been killed. They um, merged with the Catholic society and, and ceased to exist as a cultural entity, as a cultural, as a specific cultural group. And therefore, these objects, such as the Feather Cape, there's also a club um, that supposedly, or problem was probably belonged to the Tupinamba. That's why these objects were so important to keep alive the, the memory or to remember um, the Tupinamba. And now, that is not completely the case. Uh, the Tupinamba are alive, they are well, and they are thriving, I can tell you. There are, of course, um, less uh, communities that identify as Tupinamba uh, at present than there were in 1500s, um, but they are there. And uh, one of the most prominent members of the Tupin Tupinamba community nowadays is this artist and activist um, and, well, anthropologist in the making called Bliceria Tupinamba, 
um, who in 2006, uh, after having seen images of this and other of the feather capes, the 16th century feather capes, um, she reproduced, she remade a Tupinamba feather cape, which is the one um, on that side, your left, my left, your right. Um, so you can see similarities. Obviously, the type of feather used is very different. The 16th century one um, is made with feathers of the Guara, the Ibis rubra. So it's a very large red um, bird. Uh, and the other one on the left is uh, made with the chicken feathers. And I think there's also pe some peacock feathers. But she made this first attempt to re construct, re, um, rebuild really the material culture that the Topinamba no longer had, but museums did. Now, fast forward almost 30 years, or 20, sorry, fast forward almost 20 years later, Glicera Tupinamba has managed through her activism and also through the work of other um, Tupinamba activists and political leaders to um, start her journey into, um, or her journey to find and reconnect all of the existing Tupinamba feather work um, that are in Europe, the 11 capes. Uh, and this is a picture of her at the Museum der Kulturen in Basel, where, where there is um, such a feather cape, a bit different from the one in, in Copenhagen, but still a very, very interesting one that has been there since the 16th century, we think, mid 16th century, even very early. And what Glicera has been doing is she has been traveling to Paris, to Basel, to London, Oxford. She's been to Denmark, was a very important tri trip, I'll explain why. And she has reconnected to the Cape um, and the other Tupinamba materials. She has spoken to them. They have spoken to her. She has learned again by looking, examining them, how precisely those um, those feather capes are made, what kind of knots, what kind of sewing techniques you have to use. And of course, you found out those techniques, that, that that method of construction still exists in her community. So she relived it. Um, she also went to Amsterdam. I had the chance of meeting her there. Um, and here we're looking precisely at the Our Colonial Inheritance exhibition. There's a Tupinamba um, um, Boiduna Tupinamba Club that we are examining together and, and she could say things about it that I had never noticed even though I had been studying this for 20 years but she saw things that I'm, I realized okay and my knowledge is limited um, thankfully though and through her activism and through her art by remaking the capes she was able well along with other people but mainly her story um reached the uh, director of the National Museum of Denmark, who then decided, sorry, this is in Portuguese, but yeah, um, who then decided to give back one of the feather capes that they have to Brazil um, and to the new National Museum. As you may remember, in um, 2018, I think it was in September, the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro caught fire. The in, Practically the entire ethnographic collection, thousands and thousands of objects went away in flames and they are now rebuilding the museum and they're making new collections. Um, indigenous peoples themselves are making new collections for the museum and in this case Denmark will return. This is, I mean, it might sound trivial but for us in Brazil this is this is almost like the Parthenon marbles coming home, almost. Not, not that much because indigenous peoples are of course, also uh, oppressed, and there's a history of violence against them. But those of us who are a bit more on the left side of the spectrum, let's say, um, for us, this, this is huge. And for the indigenous peoples and for Glicéria and her community, this is precisely what um, cultural reemergence is about. So this is precisely what happens when things from the museum are allowed to talk to things and people outside the museum. The, the, the power generated, the interactions, the exchanges generated by the encounter of Glicéria, her art, um, other Tupinamba indigenous people, scholars and museums really allowed for something great uh, um, to happen. So we're hoping that this all can materialize soon and, and well. And of course, you're all invited to the reopening of the Museu Nacional in Rio de Janeiro at some point. It's all going to be great. Now, my last um, example of uh, this cultural reemergence, this cultural rebirth, right? This idea that 
people have the right to and have the means and the capacity and even the, the artistic creativity to reconstruct themselves through museums, in museums, through museum collections, and question us as anthropologists as they do so, is an example I'll tell you about in a minute about the Kapoor in the Netherlands. And in fact, I, I, I put this here in my talk and I was wondering, does it work? Does it work? Am I? But this morning, when I saw a few images that you showed, so Maria showed the very, very clear picture of the uh, simulated, simulated baptism in which uh, the peoples who are being photographed look back in sort of a defying gaze at the photographer saying, there's a, an equal power relation here, but I know what's going on. So I'm playing a part, but I'm playing a part. And I'm going to make it clear in this image that I'm playing a part. And the same, I think, in the pictures of them, of, um, that Agnese showed of the, um, uh, oh God, what's the name in English? Um, when you measure, um, yes, yes, the profile, yes, yes, that one. I think maybe it's my projection, but I also saw that, yeah, the woman, she was looking at us, right? So the, the same gaze back is what the Kapoor gave us when they came to the Netherlands. I'll, I'll get to my point in a minute. Um, the Kapoor are an indigenous people of Brazil. They live in the eastern part of the Amazon. So, so the Tupinambara and the coast of the Kapoor are um, in the Amazon, in the eastern part. They are a group of about 1,500 people. They speak the Kapoor language. Uh, many of them are biling bilingual Portuguese, but everybody speaks Kapoor, which is a language that descends from uh, Tupi and from the Tupinambá. And they live a very, um, as you can imagine, um, difficult life uh, due to deforestation, due to the continuous invasion of their um, demar demarcated, uh, rightfully um, given to back to them lands by woodloggers, etc. There's a lot of violence. But we've been working with them, and, and particularly Claudia Lopez, who is one of the third person um, in the picture, the second woman after me, um, who is an anthropologist uh, working at the Museu Geudi in Belém, in the Amazon. Uh, she's been working with the Capor for many years, and I've had the chance to also work with them. In 2013, they came to Leiden, uh, three Kapoor came to Leiden to, to see um, the Kapoor objects at the Museum of Ethnology there. And then 10 years later now, the Kapoor came back to Leiden again to the Netherlands uh, on my invitation of my project to uh, do something different, to go to the Museum of Natural History. Um, and the idea was, because there's a lot of these projects, these contact zone projects, okay, let's let indigenous peoples or communities have their objects back. But what do they think about other types of museums? What do they think about libraries? How do they interact? What, what's a zoo for them? You know, how, how do we expand our own understanding of these heritage institutions and knowledge institutions? And in the end, colonial institutions such as museums of natural history, libraries, zoos, et cetera. How do we understand that from an indigenous perspective? So they visited, they came, they visited Naturalis, the three Kapoor came, Valdemar from on the top, uh, the oldest uh, man, gentleman, it's Valdemar Kapoor, next to him Irakaju Kapoor, wearing the feather crown, who is the chief of the Kapoor um, at the moment, and his wife, Rosilene Nitengbe, who is the chief of the women uh, um, in the village, or in the Kapoor region. And that's very interesting because female leadership is something that has started to reemerge very recently in Kapoor, um, um, in the Kapoor context. So they came, um, we went to the library of Naturalis, where together we read uh, parts of uh, the book Historia Naturalis Brasilia that I was, um, that uh, Maria mentioned. Of course, the book was written in Latin, so we had uh, the very helpful eyes of uh, Anna Marika Willemsen, who is a museum fellow and who was there with us, who translated Latin into English, and then we translated English into Portuguese, and they themselves talked about those things in Kapoor and then translated back to us. It was a very beautiful, very difficult, but beautiful moment where they recognize the plants, the names of the plants and the animals that are depicted in this book and ended up, ended this meeting by saying thank you 
for keeping our knowledge here in this book. We haven't lost it. We still have our knowledge that they pass on through oral traditions, but thank you for keeping it in written form in this library. So that was a very nice acknowledgement. We show them the herbarium here. We have um, my colleagues, Caroline Caromano and Tinda Fernando from Museo Naturalis. They recognized again, plant species. They talked about their uses, the seeds. Um, they talked about projects they would like to do with specific uh, items of their material culture. They went to Museum Folkenkunde again, where they corrected a few um, of the mistakes in, again, the way that the exhibition was set up, the way, because this is um, in the Amazonia. If anyone has a chance to see, it's very small, very nice. There is a corridor sort of showcase at the Museum of Ethnology in Leiden, where they showed the Amazonian materials. Um, and they have the um, sort of like a, a Kapor man and a Kapor women, a woman representing the Kapor. So they were correcting, okay, this is not how to display us. This has to go here. This is missing that. But they were happy to, to see their materials there. But the most interesting moment for me and, and to get um, to a conclusion, because um, we also need to talk um, and have a drink later, um, the most important moment or the most striking moment for me was when we had a presentation. I had asked four BA students, me and my, my colleague Martin Berger, we asked them to do a survey of Kapoor collections in Europe, right? If we thought the Kapoor are coming, the least we can do is tell them what we know, where we know that their objects are. Um, and there are thousands of Kapoor objects spread through Europe, also the US, uh, even in Japan, there's Kapoor material. So, Students very, you know, they, they made this folder, they made the presentation, they gave all the information physically and digitally to Irakaju, the chief. And then at the last moment, and it's a pity I don't have a picture of it, but I'll put this picture. You can look at Irakaju and imagine him saying that at the last moment. His last speech, he said, um, well, thank you for having us in the Netherlands. Thank you for bringing us to Europe. He and his wife had never been to Europe. So now they have, um, thank you for showing all of this and thank you for showing us. I had no idea that there were so many Kapoor objects in Europe. I had no idea that you are spending so much time, resources, money and people for such a long time to keep us alive and represented in Europe. I'm going to take this back with me, this information, so that in Brazil, I can tell them if Europe is spending money in keeping us alive there, we deserve to be alive here too. And at that moment, the power relation inverted completely. I'm no longer the anthropologist studying them, or that is not the museum showcasing them. It is them using the museum, using in a very good way, using the museum to assert their rights to re-emerge and to exist. And to me, this sort of completes the circle of what we are could be trying to do in museum anthropology. So that's it, more or less. I hope it made sense. <laughs> and now we have to take questions. First of all, thank you very much. Um, Mariana, for such fascinating mm -hmm. and rich presentation. Also awful, because uh, <laughs> you give a hope uh, telling these stories and how new experience in yeah. museum are creating new opportunities to, to reshape our way to look mm -hmm. at this um, uh, material legacy, but also the legitimate owner of that object. Um, yeah, can recognize themselves, I can reestablish themselves as protagonist of yeah. their story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that there are a lot of questions for Mariana. So I think we can open a discussion and feel free to jump in with yeah. your question here and also for the people at home um, that are following us online. Yes, we have immediately the first question. I'll just wait until uh, it's all settled. Um, 
All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for your wonderful presentation um, and particularly the last part where you showed some um, representatives of the community coming back to look at the exhibitions, which also made me wonder. You showed another wonderful picture of a book listing yeah. a couple of donors uh, of objects oh, yeah. to a collection. Um, are Do you know if the families of those donors were in any way involved in sort of showing how their ancestors contributed? Contributed to a museum collection? Are they part of the of the debate, so to say? Uh, you mean the, the donors, as in the European collectors who donated to museums? Yes. Yeah, so from yeah. I guess from private collections. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in, in the case, the so the specific research that I've been doing with the Capor, there's there's it's a whole paper that <laughs> will come out at some point. But there's one main collector, one Polish. Anthrop self-made anthropologist sort of um, naturalist who went traveled to through the Amazon and collected from many groups but he really collected wholesale hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of objects and then sold them to museums so if we look at the cup or example there will be um, maybe um, well I think his wife has passed away already he passed away in 2009 Boris Malkin I don't know if his wife is still alive, Elena, um, but that's, and, and I know that there is a researcher in Poland, in Krakow, Magdalena Nierowska, I think, who is studying the letters of Mokin to his wife, which um, bring a lot of information about how he collected and, and what he thought of that. So I know that she's working on that. I'm not. Um, but that's a good question. I wonder, do, do you know of examples of, of family members or, or people? Because it, it is something that can happen. And I imagine, um, yeah, more recent or, you know, younger people who may want to dispose of the of their parents, grandparents, things may have a different view on uh, giving them back. Yeah, I don't know personally about any of those examples, apart from maybe, but that's not really related, like the whole Jan Sixth family yeah, that... Yeah. that uh, yeah, different generations are continuously talking about, yeah. but that's, of course, a very different setting, yeah. a very privileged setting. But I was curious about this because I can imagine that um, for some of these families, like the, particularly later generations, they want to have a say in how their ancestors were also now who are now being portrayed in these museums. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, I was I wondering can imagine. if they are. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a different but the same example. Uh, I was called yesterday um, as I was working in the library here. I was called by a certain journalist from a certain paper in the Netherlands who um, told me about a certain museum in a certain city of the Netherlands that had um, a very small but very interesting collection of um, indigenous um, spears right? or bows and arrows, but well, weapons that they no longer thought made sense in their collection, but they they wanted to give back either to the, the people, we know who they were, um, or give it to a different museum. And one of the questions that this journalist asked me was, well, you know, but if they give it back to the indigenous people, maybe the objects won't survive, maybe they'll perish, they'll be destroyed, maybe, you know, is it, isn't it, could it be better to give these objects to a museum, another museum, that will keep them and use them for um, educative uh, purposes? And, and that's a very valid question, but in my opinion, and that's an anthropological opinion, but also personal, if you're giving something back, you're giving something back. You're not telling people what to do with it. Um, so I suppose it must be hard for family members of people who are now being portrayed as colonial collectors. But that's the spirit of the moment. I'm sure these people were very praised at some point and, and now they are not anymore. So I, I can imagine that at a personal level, it's very difficult, but there's you can, you can only have a say up to a certain point. And then you have to live your life, I think. But again, I'm radical and I'm not, um, my ancestors collected nothing, so it's easy. <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> okay, I see another question from Anna Marika hey. uh, online. Uh, I Anna don't know Marika. if you, Anna Marika, you are saying the question. Um, Maybe, yes, so you can see. Museum it. catalogs. <laughs> nice, good question. Well, I think you can tell us, but um, I think if you're talking about um, TMS or catalogs um, used in the museums themselves, what I see is at least an attempt or an intention 
to include the sort of information that I discussed here and that uh, the, the information that is generated in those collaborative encounters as part of um, the catalogs or, or the, the, the Fischer Catalografica, so the inventories yeah. inside the museum. I, I'm more thinking of published catalogs, uh, museum guides. Um, I, I, I would normally expect the whole um, uh, but you you rightly said the 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 total um, stressing at the moment of the provenance and um, uh, the, the the sort of disclaimers about uh, where the collection came from, but I'm not seeing it yet, and I wonder mm. if it's if, if we are he more hesitant to put it into print than we are to say it in 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 words. Possibly, I, th I think you're right. And and possibly the reason is that we, like a very large, we don't know enough. We would have to print things like, we're not sure. Yeah. We don't know, we imagine. Um, and, and as you, indeed, your question uh, points to something very important, which is the power of catalogs and the power of museum documentation. Um, because once you um, print in a catalog and you add information about provenance or about something, it really becomes very official and powerful. So I'm thinking of, of those uh, art fairs where collectors unnamed uh, are having their collections sold and their names are preserved, but this uh, painting or this um, statue was exhibited at uh, this or that museum. So the, the museum also, and now I'm really thinking of, of Tony Bennett uh, writing about the 19th century uh, birth of museums. The museum also has this enormous power um, of legitimizing things. And I guess, um, writing, we are not sure this is dubious could be a step too far. At the moment, um, it's but there, there might be. At the moment, it's sort of a dialogue, right? The museums are uh, being hesitant, um, at least to put things into print. And the the real um, accusations or accusative and otherwise, um, so the, the, the real sensitive things are being laid bare by journalists in books, basically. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, is this or, or new species, or... or is this something we will we will? Because most museums are doing a lot of research in this field, mm -hmm. um, and and it's 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 actually changing the the databases. But I'm not seeing it changing the well exhibitions a little bit, but printed matter, um, museum guides, and mm -hmm. those are the things that also circulate outside of the museum when people are not visiting, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that and that get that's... repeated in publications. So yeah, indeed, and you I can think you have a quote, point. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very interesting observation. I think it's something we will we will see unfold. We will I see. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. First question. Yeah. Is there any effort to change the name of Museum of Civilizations or generally? stop pretending that i don't know it feels like we are bringing different temporalities into one space oh yeah or... that's a museum that's what the museum does but isn't it problematic i mean for example the museum the museo della civiltà in rome the mm. having the pigrini collection also has medieval objects mm -hmm. and I, I don't know it feels it feels like it's also it it places people it places mm -hmm. Yes, but that's that's indeed that's what the museum does. It places people, it classifies, it separates and adds. It, it um, yeah, that's that's what a museum does. Um, I think changing there's a lot of debate about changing the name of museums, a lot. And as I I, I try to show, many times this debate comes when uh, a, a sort of reorganization or merger or budget cuts or things like that have to happen. Um, and that's the moment when the museum um, is allowed space to rethink itself and, and has to reinvent itself. So th there's a lot of talk about renaming. I'm not sure how useful it is um, to keep renaming because the collections are still there. And I think it's very much about the work you do inside. And, and I'll agree with you that there is a very large gap 
between what is going on behind the scenes, what curators, directors, marketing, education people are trying to do and what gets translated to the public. And, and this is something that I think really many, many people I know in museums are trying to, you know, show through exhibitions, like the temporary shows that I showed, shows that I showed. Um, so I think that's that's really where the problem lies. But different temporalities, that's the definition of a museum. And there's a very good paper by a, a, a good um, friend and colleague of mine, Laura von Bruckhoven, called Museums as Heterotopia, in which she discusses this term based on Foucault's work on, on the concept of heterotopia. And she's really reflecting on the work of museums as the sort of places where temporalities and geographies come together and are drifted apart, sort of forcefully, so in a sort of non-natural way. But yeah, but that's what these institutions do and have done since their emergence as national institutions in the 19th century. And, and I guess that's again going back <laughs> to our symbol, to our workshop of today. That's what they were intending to do. Huh? That's what they set out to do from the beginning: classify, put together, put hierarchies. This is this, this is that, and 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 now, yeah, they're trying to um, let's say liberate themselves from that straitjacket while still having to deal with the material legacies of that moment. So it's yeah, it's a very complicated uh, thing you're asking. But yeah, indeed, you're right. Yes. Can I try to to maybe push this question a little bit further, <laughs> to pose it in a very direct way? Does it make sense to have under the same roof uh, the Middle Age, the colonialism, Africa, Asia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And for example, we will have soonish, because nothing happens fast in Rome, a museum of the Holocaust, for example. Mm -hmm. They will have its own place at the center of Rome, whereas all these other things, uh, in, including colonialism, are somehow relegated in air, far away from everything. So I guess the question is really like, is colonialism so little important in Italy that we can put it with the Middle yeah. Age and with everything over there? Ah, uh, okay, okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, well, I will not dare say anything about what Italy should do when I am in Italy with a room full of Italian and Italian experts. So it's really not for me to say. Um, I think there are at least two elements to that question. Um, does it make sense to put Africa, Oceania, Amer the Americas, the medieval period, blah, 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 all together under one roof as such? Well, we're in a library and that's what a library does too. So why not? Um, I guess the problem is, and again, going back to the context of uh, the workshop today, when you look at it from a more systemic perspective, you have two problems. First, the merging of the of colonialism as a problem, a historical problem, and, and a moral problem of the present. When you merge that with things such as the medieval folklore, of, um, yeah, popular traditions, um, and the problem of having it far away in the area where very well few people get to go, or at least less people than will probably go to the Museum of the Holocaust. So, but that is a, a question that I am not equipped to answer, not being Italian or Roman. <laughs> um, I suppose you have uh, maybe an idea of what you would like seen. Um, I would personally be much happier if I could visit uh, the Brazilian materials around here than having to go all the way there. But yeah, it's a political choice and it's a political choice that comes uh, in a moment of neoliberal economics where things that are problematic are often lumped together and other, if I have to say this, created as authority. So yeah. now I agree with you that the answer is no. But the reality points to something else. I'm, I'm happy the collections are still there and still exist. That they're not. That there was a moment in the Netherlands where a certain museum decided to sell all of its American um, and, Af and African collection, sell to the highest bidder. It never happened. They were stopped. But you can go as far as that in this uh, in this world we're living. Okay, we have a more question. So Carlo, then 
Willem, was thank, a question? Thank you for your inspiring yes, lecture. Yes, yeah. And, and um, I was particularly impressed by the reference you made to the Tupinamba. Mm -hmm. And when you said also that it was believed that they did not exist anymore, but then they exist. And, and the fact that the contact zone, museum says contact zone, can also reinforce, if I understood correctly, the very existence of, of a group of people. So my question is, and I will state it very, I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm an historian, not an anthropologist. So I guess that the fact that a group exists or not anymore is a matter of gray scale, right? It's not just on off. It depends on, of course. Yeah. okay, of course. So, can museums be contact zones also when indigenous people are, you know, in a very state, uh, in a state of existence where when the, their voice is not, cannot be so loud because they're very, very assimilated or, um, and this is so that my question is to push your mm -hmm. argument to, to mm -hmm. the edge and mm -hmm. say, what about the not more existent group of people like the Taino, the Guanche. Oh, the, the Taino Amazi. exists. So how, okay, so sorry, that's. <laughs> that's no, no, just joking. Okay, so what yeah. about the Amazigh from the Canary Islands yeah. to yeah. say that we're, I don't yeah. know if for you yeah. exist or not. Yeah. So can, can a museum be a contact zone also for that and how? I suppose so in a different way. I mean, I think, uh, so your, your question is about communities that, that do not, have a physical voice, let's say, uh, right. I, I thought you were asking something else. Good question. I think if they have um, voices uh, that represent them, then sure, absolutely. Um, although the result of the contact zone will be probably something else unless, uh, I don't know, unless um, efficient, less, less full of strength, you see, the, the problem is if you're talking, if okay, let's so let's take uh, the example of a people that we could, that more or less everyone could agree no longer exist as a distinct group. If there are people who want to relieve that, you know, who want to, to, to talk for them and to make the museum be a contact zone for that, then they sort of reemerge as well. And that group who is trying to make that reemergence happen has their own political. Um, ideas and reasons for it as well. So you come in on sort of a vicious circle of the museum being again, you know, the machine of political um, legitimation. So I, I find it difficult how that would work. It would certainly work somehow, but I, I find it, I'll have to think, maybe this has happened and I'm not remembering, but it's it's important, it's important. Yeah. But the Taino, the, the, there's a whole community or that uh, that uh, identifies as Taino well, well in New York for sure, but also in, in Puerto Rico and uh, and other parts of the Caribbean. But again, very good discussion because some people will say they're not. Sorry, I'll stop talking. I have another question to answer. Uh, thank you for this very interesting uh, information. I just wanted to add something about this uh, Palazzo della Civiltà because what I think is interesting what happens there is that you have uh, not one specific category of authority, but you have a lot of different hmm. authorities in one space. And I think it says a lot about, oh, and I'm also not Italian, so I should uh, watch what yourself. I say. But uh, I think that's really interesting that you have uh, a medieval collection, but not a Renaissance collection. Hmm. And you have uh, also, I think, an Italian folkloristic yeah. collection, but not like... Uh, something of high culture made in Rome or Florence mm. uh, or, or Venice or something. So I think that, that that is really interesting. And what I also think is a point that uh, maybe we could discuss, uh, like the this, uh, <clears throat> um, this um, you have the self and the other, but I think this, like this Lacanian, concept of the mm. other uh, I think it's also a lot about in so you also talked you mentioned the internalized other so I think it's really interesting um, to research what this says about the state institutions mm. where our museums themselves because this one exhibition was called our colonial heritage the, I think the the Tropen Museum the, the, yeah our colonial inheritance yeah yeah 
Um, and then you see really a reflection of uh, the continuity of uh, saying that I am this person and they are the others. Mm -hmm. And I think you, I think you see the same when, when, when you, when you talk a little bit about reimmersion, rebirth of, mm. of something cultural in another culture, mm. but this rebirth is totally mediated through uh, this colonial state institution, which is a museum. Mm -hmm. um, and this rebirth is also, I think, uh, like a return to origin or something, but it's mediated through uh, uh, such an institution. So I think that is interesting to think about how this self and other work. And I thought, what uh, do you think about this? Well, that's, I don't know if I have a, a ready-made answer. I think you're talking about a, a sort of um, continuous dynamic that is um, very, um, very visible, um, at least in our discussion today um, and now. And it's visible when you visit the Musée de la Civilita and you see all of those other others um, together, but it's the continuous uh, struggle human struggle, political struggle for existence, right? I mean, uh, um, many, um, I don't know outside of Latin America, <laughs> but in many indigenous groups in Latin America, the name that they, the people, so Kapor, what does Kapor mean? Ka is forest, por is people, people of the forest. And when they have to name their enemy, they use a word that will mean the non-people, the others. And, and this is very common in many different indigenous languages, also not of the Tupi family group, family stock. So this um, sort of, yeah, urge to define the self by defining what is not, I think it's there. It's in language, it's in our daily relationships, in family dynamics, in institutional dynamics. Um, and the museum is one of the most powerful mater materializations of that. So I think it's an ongoing um, yeah, human dynamic really, which you can then look at and analyze from different perspectives. As an anthropologist, I'm looking at that today through the lens of what happens inside museums, what happens to the museums, but what happens to people who come to the museums, not as visitors, but as um, owners, let's say, uh, of the material. But but yeah, it's an eternal question, no? Um, hello. It's my turn back. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, and also, I have to agree with you that the point you made at the end of the full circle moment was uh, indeed very touching. Yeah. Um, my question adds a bit on to what was asked uh, before the last point. I forgot your name, unfortunately, because <laughs> um, I was, uh, it really resonated with me when you said that the other is the point of arrival and the point of departure in the discourse around eth uh, ethnographical or colonial you know, museology in general. Um, and what I was wondering about is how does the point of departure change when there is little to no provenance on mm. the other? Um, for instance, on objects brought along by lootings or explorations when there is no real um, data on it or objects that were lost and then rediscovered in a depot, but also void of any origin, um, mm. should then the straightforward strategy still be to reestablish that provenance or should it not be? Or what if this fails? What other strategies are there mm -hmm. then to deal with colonial heritage? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I think there are many ways to deal with that. The, the should, I, I'm not really, I, I don't know how to answer should questions because it should is always in perspective to someone or to something. So you can make any choice you want. Um, but say objects that are likely of colonial origin are found that have very little um, documentation and that happens all the time. Well, the objects themselves, like the exhibition by Vicky Muniz, by the, by the you know um, paintings on the other side, the objects themselves will tell you a lot. Um, I, I'm an anthropologist, but I work at a faculty of archaeology, and, and there are some of those in the room, um, I think, at least one that I know. Um, and they can tell us how you, from one object that we 
untrained eye otherwise would say, eh, cannot do anything with it. You can actually say a lot about where it comes from, what it might have been used for, who might have used it, made it, why it was found where it was found. So this is one of the ways to deal with colonial um, collections that have no written documentation on them, be they archeological, ethnographic, um, whatever they are. But again, it really is a matter of, it's all a matter of context. You know, when, when we talk about museums, it is so ad hoc. There are little formulas that can tell us what to do in which situation, uh, but there are a lot of methodologies that we can draw from different disciplines that will help us um, discover what we need to discover, to discover to fulfill a certain purpose. And I guess the question is, what is that purpose? What is the point of arrival in that case? And then I can find out what my departure should be. But there are many, there are many options. There are things, and and yeah, so, you know, technologically, we've been advanced. Not me. Other people have been advancing so much technologically that you can find out the most uh, amazing uh, there are projects for instance just to talk about Tupinamba material there are projects that are sampling very very small um, little bits of the wood of those uh, clubs and trying to define uh, when and where uh, the trees that originated that those objects originated from where they came from and when they were cut so there's, you know, there, there's all kinds of technologies that allow us to at least partially reconstruct what might have been of a collection. And thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. Um, I was wondering if you have noticed a difference in exhibitions between countries in Europe or even America. Mm when the country has engaged in direct colonial contact or not. So example for Denmark, I don't think they have direct colonial contact in Brazil. No. So is there a difference between countries like Portugal that have and Denmark that hasn't? Yes, yes. But again, it's very ad hoc. It's very per country. So Denmark had colonies, not Brazil. Um, and the reason they have Brazilian material there now is because of the Dutch uh, presence, the Dutch colony in Brazil. So they refer to that a little bit uh, in their exhibition. In Portugal, uh, interest, you know, the relationship between Brazil and Portugal is quite interesting because Brazil is a former colony, but one that uh, got its independence in a very peculiar way, um, we were an empire, we were the seat uh, for, for a while because of the Napoleonic Wars, the crown, the, the, the royal family immigrated to Rio de Janeiro, so we were the seat of the um, Portuguese empire in, in the tropics, and then we were an empire ourselves, and then, you know, so it's, so Portugal certainly doesn't have a different or a more critical, self-critical discourse than other countries. I think the real self-critical painful stuff from what I've seen you can find in places like France and Germany and Italy that have active groups at present claiming um, to be seen and claiming for their heritage and I suppose it's different if we analyze um, the former African colonies of Portugal, so the, the Angola and Mozambique and their material legacies in Portugal, they have a very different re museological, let's say, um, uh, relationship to Portugal than Brazil does. And there's some publications, there's some very specific publications about the whole African uh, le or the legacy of, of colonialism in Africa in Portugal. So it, it does different per country, but the more, what I can say for sure is the more you have a living active population demanding their rights, whatever those rights may be, the more self-critical museum will have to be. And if we look at the history or the context of, of the Humboldt Forum, I mean, there's so much said, there's so much criticism when it was an idea while it was being built after it opened um, that they cannot but try to um, address those issues. So it's really... Uh, it really, there is a difference, short answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much for your really inspiring talk. I also find the conclusion very moving mm -hmm. um, about the power dy dynamics flipping around and indigenous communities kind of becoming the owner uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, the part of that part of the collection. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and your talk is called uh, Museum, Museum is the Archive. Yeah. So my question is uh, about that notion of the archive because always museums have part of their collection, of course, on display, mm -hmm. uh, open to the public, and other parts are kind of behind closed doors, uh, like an archive in a more yeah. like uh, smaller definition. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about those power dynamics. How do they, do you have any thoughts about how they change uh, when they're openly, when these objects are openly uh, publicly on display versus when they are kind of in the not non-accessible part of the... Yeah, yeah. Well, the, I guess what changes yeah. depends on, again, on, on the claims and on the demands for it. So um, museums have different amounts of objects and, and exhibition uh, policies. Of course, a permanent exhibition is called permanent for a reason, so they, it doesn't change that often. Um, there are museums where 95, 98% of their collection is in storage um, and changing a permanent exhibition will take a lot of time and resources. Per uh, temporary exhibitions are the place to, to kind of let the collection rotate. But indeed, very much like an archive, it depends on um, interested people calling the documents or calling the objects or, or asking for the things that they're interested in. And curators in that sense have a huge uh, a role to play because they will know what's in the collection very well and certainly better than the general public. So there's, there's an attempt um, or at least a wish to reach out and to connect to communities and to let people know what they have. And, and this is not only for indigenous America, this is for all the world. So that's where the work of curators becomes extremely important in, in you know, allowing for those spontaneous claims to, to emerge. But I guess, well, I didn't go very far in my reflection of the museum as an archive. I could, I could probably do that um, as well, not now at some point, but I guess the, the, what I was pointing at was the power dynamic. Um, and towards the end of my talk, really pointing to the fact that the power dynamic is changing and has changed. And now the ones who were, um, who became others are now in charge in, instead of us. But the power dynamic is, is similar to that of an archive. And I guess we could think about that in a course at the CNIR together with Marjorie. And anyway, I'm thinking a lot. <laughs> I'm wondering, when would you take your child to a museum like this, to Tropen Museum? Should there be an age restriction? Would you spend a lot of time explaining what colonialism, violism, like, would you take them at all? I have. I have. <laughs> the small one here has been there a couple of times and the older ones as well. <laughs> Actually, very funny. This is so personal, but I'll tell you. The first time I went to the Tropen Museum with the children, um, who were not my children of my husband, we were like, oh, let's go, let's go. Nice, Mariana likes museum stuff, let's do that. And there was this exhibition about gender. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird, right? I'm going to go to an exhibition about gender with children of my then boyfriend and of course you know I mean they were what were they nine and 12 at the time and and they knew the whole thing by heart and they were totally fine with all of it and they were criticizing no 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 this is wrong this should be something they were totally fine with it and I was the one uptight and I think it will be the same for colonialism um of course, there's a class difference, right? I think, uh, uh, especially when you're talking about the Tropen Museum um, and other such museums around Europe, you will have children um, of certain backgrounds who will not have talked about, in this case, gender, or in other case, um, uh, colonialism at home, and going to a museum like that might be conf confrontational. But for that same reason, important and interesting. Um, and there will be others for whom um, I think, you know, my son, when he's 12, is going to be like, I will not go to a museum ever again. And colonialism was good. I can't stand my mother anymore. Very natural reaction. But I don't see any age limit. I think the museums are there to confront um, um, people with, with uh, what they allow themselves to be confronted with. So why not? You know, and taking into account those background constraints, it's all there. 
I think that's a great way to, <laughs> to close this discussion. So thank you very much again to Mariana Franzoso for this wonderful <laughs> lecture. Thank you to all for the questions. Uh, there are more questions, but we will have a, a drink first. Okay. So um, thank you to those who are following online. So and hope to see all of you again for our next activities. We don't have a second one at the moment. We don't know exactly the name of the guest, but um, um, if you want to be um, informed about our program, please subscribe to our newsletter. And now it's really the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's you. have a drink. Bye. Thanks.